Okay, uh, so let's get started. So hi everyone, uh, welcome to this workshop on intro to anomaly detection. Uh, my name is Michael. Um, I'm a, a little bit about me first, I guess. I'm a fourth year computer engineer studying um, at University of Waterloo. Um, I've done two co-ops as a software developer and I'm doing my second co-op as a data scientist building um, anomaly detection models on time series and image, uh, image data. Uh, and so here's a brief presentation like overview. Um, this workshop's intended for mostly people who are like beginner data scientists. Um, it's okay if like you're not a data scientist yet or you're aspiring. Um, I think you'll still get something useful out of this. Um, but yeah, like just knowing what the difference is between like supervised or unsupervised learning, uh, knowing what a neural network is and what it looks like, um, just like general really entry level stuff like that will, will help. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start off with um, defining anomaly detection. Then we're gonna talk about challenges that are specific to anomaly detection. Then we'll go over um, the method of having anomaly scores. And then we'll go over uh, the performance metrics that you need to carefully choose when doing anomaly detection for your model. Um, and then we'll end by recapping with an example uh, that, that ties together all the ideas we've talked about uh, on one slide. And then we'll end uh, with a Q&A session uh, that'll be unrecorded. Oh, and yeah, by the way, I'm like recording this Zoom meeting um, so if you have any questions, like feel free to ask like in the chat. I don't think it'll show up in the recording, um, but if you're too shy or something, uh, it's okay. Like you can ask me when like offline after this presentation, when there's no recording and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so yeah, first of all, like, you know, what is anomaly detection? Um, anomaly detection is basically a task, which is to separate um, anomalous data from normal data. And when we say normal here, we don't mean Gaussian. We mean like in the more kind of layman sense, like normal as in like just average run of the, run of the mill kind of data. And so um, in this terminology, like anomaly is the same as outlier and normal is the same as inlier. Um, so I'll be using those terms like interchangeably and also like anomaly detection or AD for short um, is the same as outlier detection or OD. And when I said data, um, that could mean like a variate or a feature or a particular sample in a population or a particular observation uh, in, a, in a population. Uh, and so like, you know, why should you care like as a member of the audience? And in my opinion, the reason why you should care is because um, automating anomaly detection using machine learning uh, saves a lot of money on manual labor, uh, which means it has a lot of business value in the real world. A lot of companies are, they really care about anomaly detection because if you can automate that, it'll save them a lot of trouble. Um, and so some real world examples are in credit card fraud detection. So given the transaction history of a customer for let's say like a year, two years, three years, can you identify which transaction is anomalous? Um, or like detecting like breaks in some PCB routing. Um, so like if PCB stands for printed circuit board and I'll, I'll, there's a slide later on it where I'll go into more detail or maybe like, you know, you're doing some steel manufacturing and you have images of those uh, steel parts and you want to detect when a surface on that part is busted basically like damaged or just corroded or something and you want to automatically detect that using machine learning. Uh, so let's start with like something more um, contrived like here's like a toy data set. So here we have two variates. So the x-axis is the first feature. The second axis is the second feature. It doesn't really matter what these features are but you can kind of see that clearly like all those white uh, dots, they're so clustered together that you, you feel very tempted to say like, okay, those are just normal. So in this data set, yes, those white points are true inliers. So they're actually just normal data points. And then the black dots are the abnormal data points or what we call the true outliers. And so uh, in these six plots here, essentially it's the same data set over and over again. The only difference is that uh, the algorithm or the, the model used to detect the anomalies. So it's the, the algorithm used to separate the, the white points from the black points. Um, essentially, you can see that, you know, even though the data is exactly the same, uh, because each algorithm makes a different assumption about what it, about what the definition of an anomaly is, it's going to learn um, the red dotted line, which is the decision function, which basically says yes inlier or no it's uh, no out yes to inlier or no outlier. Um, basically making that decision between inlier versus outlier, that's what the red, red line represents. That decision changes based off of the assumptions that the model makes on what an outlier is. Um, so that's why you can get like on the top left, you get like this kind of circle spherical expanding outward. Um, and then I believe the, the blue shaded region represents like the 
intensity of like the confidence that a model thinks that that region would belong to like an anomalous data point. Um, and you can see that like in contrast on the top right, you have instead of circles, you have like very sharp squares or like lines. And that's why you have like a square box there. And it just all comes down to like the assumptions and the methods uh, that each algorithm makes. And we'll go into a lot more detail um, uh, later on. But I just wanted to start with something simple here to get some intuition to start with. And so yeah, I like go with an example of like a PCB. So this is what a printed circuit board is. Uh, you know, it's essentially like, placing all these different electrical components and parts onto this board. And then these uh, lines, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but like essentially these lines here, uh, they create like, they're essentially like electrical connections between these different components. And so maybe one, like one anomaly detection task, uh, which is a mix of computer vision is like given images of many, many, many PCBs, can you detect where there are breaks in the lines? So let's say like at the top here, there was like, um, a line that was that was just like had a break in it, which means that that connection is faulty. And so maybe if you're on like a manufacturing line or you're making all of these in mass, you want to have automatic detection of those breaks. So you can maybe discard that component or repair it uh, as opposed to letting it go further down the line and waste more resources and waste more money. And you can see that, that would be a very tedious thing for a human to do and kind of hard, right? Because there's so many things on this board. Or maybe um, a different task, but also on PCBs would be like, you want to see when there's like scratches on the board like maybe if there's like if there were some scratches here on the left on the green that would be unacceptable for some reason and so you can see that like depending on your task um, and depending on the data you collected what is considered anomalous is like very contextual and that can make things kind of challenging another example is a uh, steel surface defects uh, detecting them automatically so i got this from a Kaigo competition um, but essentially in these two images um, you can see here that these are two like steel different i guess plates or parts um, and in purple here, we have bounded a region where this is the anomalous region or the anomalous texture that shows that this steel part uh, in particular is anomalous or needs to be discarded or repaired. Um, and you can see that in the top left, you have like these three lines, I guess you call them, or scratches. And like intuitively, you might say, like, okay, like that's, that's just an anomaly. Um, and so teaching that to a computer can be hard. And that's kind of why that, that's, I guess, really the field of computer vision, right? Is teaching a computer like how to interpret images and video. Um, but I guess we take it a step further in anomaly detection because this is image data and anomaly detection. So it's a mixture of computer vision and anomaly detection. And you might think like, okay, like, yeah, that's pretty obvious. But what about like the top right? Like there's a lot of specs here and there. So like, how come those aren't anomalies? Or maybe like on the second picture here, like you see this vertical strip that's sort of faint. Like how come that's not an anomaly? Um, so like, that I guess would come down to domain expertise on like someone who knows more about steel manufacturing than I do. Um, but that has to be like that domain expertise has to be like manually encoded by some human who has to basically go and label each pixel in this image to, to label the pixel as outlier or inlier. And so you can see already like that would be really tedious and also like not not like not not really scalable as you have more data as you have more images and more products and so forth. So doing this in a and so, and so labeling data like this is really like sort of like a more supervised fashion way of doing it. And so the interesting part of anomaly detection is how could you achieve the same task with like less labels or maybe even no labels? Um, and that would be unsupervised learning. Yeah, so, so, so some challenges that I may have mentioned already and anomaly that are specific to anomaly detection is that uh, defining an anomaly uh, can depend on the context. So for example, like going back to steel manufacturing, like it really depends on the context, like maybe on this data set, like these types of patterns that we're seeing on the steel is anomalous, but maybe on a different data set, like, like these, these types of textures or these types of patterns in an image are totally normal. Um, or like, if you're going back to PCB, like maybe what you care, what you're looking for is these breaks or maybe what you're looking for is scratches in the green areas. Um, and so it depends on context there. Um, the other challenge with anomaly detection is that uh, some types of outliers, um, they're only gonna be in the test set or the test data, and they're not going to be in the training data. Um, and so that's pretty tricky, right? Because like in a more supervised fashion, you you assume that you have like an equal representation of each class and that the classifier is going to be able to predict into each class well on its own. But here, you, you just can't make that assumption because in real life, most of the time, especially if you're like running a business, a lot of your data is just going to be like normal data, right? Like inlier, like things are going to be okay most of the time which means you're gonna have a lot of inlier data and a lot less outlier data. 
Um, maybe you, you won't even, yeah. So essentially the, I guess like the solution or this family of solutions to this would be called like novelty detection. So there's a lot of papers on this and essentially novelty detection methods uh, assume upfront that like you're only gonna be able to train on in layer data and that any, uh, and basically the model is gonna like learn the underlying di data distribution of in layer data. And so during test time, um, it's going to, it's going to basically see like, okay, does this new observation lie in the distribution that I learned during training or not? Because if it's not, then it's probably new, right? Hence novelty. And so the other big challenge with anomaly, uh, anomaly detection is outliers are usually not labeled in real life. And the reasons for that is because like just labeling is very like, it costs too much time and money. Um, and also it can be sometimes hard for humans to detect if there even is an anomaly to begin with. Like you can imagine if you had like hundreds of time series data, for example, it can be very hard to pick out when an anomaly starts, when an anomaly ends, or where the anomaly even is, if there even is one. Um, and sort of like the family of solutions for that is basically unsupervised anomaly detection methods. And so next we'll talk about uh, anomaly scores. Um, and so the idea of using anomaly scores in your model is basically don't get them, don't make the model directly predict whether that sample is an inlier or an outlier. Uh, instead, you should make the model compute an anomaly score. And then as a data scientist, you choose the threshold for the model to predict whether it's an inlier or an outlier. And so the, the motivation behind this uh, is because in real life, usually like a false positive or the cost of making a mistake, uh, depending on the type of mistake is not equal. So the cost of a false positive mistake versus a false negative mistake, those costs are usually not equal. So for example, uh, if you're trying to like diagnose cancer um, in a patient, uh, a false positive uh, would mean that the model predicts that there is cancer on the patient, but the patient actually doesn't have cancer. So you could see how that would be kind of inconvenient, right? Like a lot of patients going to get further testing done only to find out that they actually didn't have cancer. Um, they'd feel you know, relieved, but it's still very, really inconvenient and causes a lot of strain on the medical system. And then the false negative would be that a model predicts that there's no cancer, but the patient actually did have cancer. And you can see that, that would be life-threatening because a patient should have gotten more help, but they, they didn't. Um, and so you can see that it, depending on the context in the real world, there's just not equal. And so what thresholding is nice for is that it allows us to control uh, the trade-off between false positives and false negatives, which we'll explore uh, in more detail uh, in, later on. But uh, on the top right, uh, this is an image of like a simple like two class classification uh, confusion matrix. And so at the at the top, I guess, um, axis you could call it is like you have the actual class. So this would be like the ground truth label uh, attached to that observation, uh, which could be positive or negative. Uh, if it's actual class positive, that would mean that um, that observation is like actually an anomaly. And if it's negative, it means it's an inlier uh, for predicted class. So that would be whatever class the model predicted, um, which is could also be you know positive or negative. So um, oftentimes you can kind of set up anomaly detection to be like a special form of like two class classification or binary classification. And this is a common confusion matrix to see. And so really what you're interested in is like, if you look at this confusion matrix, the diagonal in bold, the true positive and true negative, um, that's what you hope as a data scientist is like large in, in number. You hope that the elements on the diagonal are big because that means your model most of the time is correct. And you hope that the non-diagonal elements are small because those, those represent mistakes. Um, and yeah, uh, and it took me, I guess, like like some time to wrap my head around like confusion matrices and whatnot and different types of like false positives, false negatives. Uh, but I think the simplest way to like kind of break it down is that um, when the first letter or like the first word in like false slash positive, oh, sorry, false slash true or like positive slash negative is that the first word represents whether or not the model was correct in its prediction. So for example, like the top left, it's true positive, which means that the model was correct in its prediction. And then the bottom right, it's also correct. Um, and that's why it starts with the word true. Whereas in the off diag like our non-diagonal elements, you start with the word false because the model predicts false um, or predicted incorrectly, sorry. And the second word, positive or negative, uh, that represents like what the model predicted. Um, so you can see in the first row here, like the P, um, the second letter is always P because the model predicted positive. And then in the second row uh, with N, 
you see the model always predicts negative, and so that's why the second letter is n. Uh, and yeah, so now we'll go over an example with uh, thresholding on anomaly scores. So let's focus on like the top plot first. Um, so let's pretend you had you had a, a, a anomaly detection model, and it was able to assign an anomaly score for each observation you gave it. Uh, like let's say you have like um, a simple like dog. Like a, like a simple like cat or like not cat classifier where like cat is inlier and not cat is like outlier. And let's say you had way more cat pictures than you had non-cat pictures. Um, so each picture, cat or no cat, is going to have an anomaly score. Um, and your model, like you'll just take that image of the cat, you'll just shove it through the input, and then out pops an anomaly score for that image. Um, and then if you do that for all of your data set, you'll, you can generate these histograms. And so the variative interest here is really the anomaly score. And the idea is that we hope that we can train or build a model that will learn essentially uh, maybe two distributions, like one distribution that's more obviously belonging to inliers and another dis distribution that more obviously belongs to outliers just by looking at the anomaly scores. And so in this top plot here, in like the case of worse class separation, um, you can see that these two distributions, like they actually overlap, right? And so because they overlap, if you were to set a threshold on the anomaly score, which is our only variant of interest here, um, you would kind of struggle to put the, the threshold in a satisfying spot, right? Or you, like, you can't really put that threshold anywhere in a spot that's going to perfectly classify inliers versus outliers. Um, and so that kind of goes back to what I said on the previous slide with like false positives and false negatives is that like graphically here, you can see that any uh, outliers that are below this threshold are going to get misclassified as uh, false negatives. And then all the blue points or the, all the inlier points above this threshold in the anomaly score are going to get misclassified as uh, false positives. And so by controlling the position of this threshold, you control how many false positives versus how many false negatives you want. And so this is, like I guess, more realistic to what you would see in the above plot. Like in real world, it's usually not that easy to separate inlier images from outlier images or cat images from non-cat images. Uh, depending on how the data was collected and how complex your model is and so forth. And in the bottom here, we can see like in a perfectly ideal world where you had like an amazing model, amazing data and everything, um, you can see that, okay, well, because the inlier and outlier anomaly scores are so well separated, I can put the threshold basically anywhere I want. I'm always going to get like zero false positives and zero false negatives. Uh, cool. So now that we've talked a lot about anomaly scores, you might have a couple questions. Um, such as like, well, how do I choose an anomaly score? And the answer really is like, it depends on the problem in the model. Uh, so I'll give some examples. So for example, like uh, there's KNN. So uh, for those of you, like some of you may have heard of KNN before, but it stands for K nearest neighbor. So KNN is like most popular for its like use as a classification algorithm, um, where like you basically count like the, for, for a given data point or for all data points or for, you start with one data point and you say, look, for, look at the K nearest neighbors of that data point, uh, count the number of like, uh, like, like of those k nearest neighbors, which of them belong to each class, and then the most popular class in those k nearest neighbors, like that's probably the class I belong to too. And you do that for all the data points, and you can classify things. So instead, what you do here in anomaly detection, you can basically take the same algorithm and tweak it so that for a given data point, its anomaly score is its distance to its k nearest neighbor. Um, some other examples will be like uh, autoencoders, GANs, and PCA or in all three of those kind of I guess, family of methods or family of models, because there's a lot of different flavors of the three that I just said, um, there's some sort of reconstruction that's possible. Um, and basically for a given like image, let's say like a picture of a cat, you know, you, you, you take that cat as an input into the model and then the model spits out something and it should be like, you know, a reconstructed image of the cat more or less. And then you can compare the output of the model, like the new cat picture to the original cat picture, which is the input. And then you can have some reconstruction error there and just set the reconstruction error as your, uh, as your anomaly score. Um, and we'll talk more in detail about autoencoders um, and GANs. Like, I think we have a workshop on that later on. So, and PCA, we might also have a workshop on that later on. So I'll save that for uh, after this workshop or maybe we'll go more into detail in a separate workshop later. But yeah, um, the, the other thing is like, another question we ask ourselves is like, okay, what can get assigned an anomaly score? And so it can actually be like an observation, like let's say like a, like, a, like, a, like um, if we have pictures, each picture would get an anomaly score, that would be an observation, or it could be features. So in the case of cat pictures, like each pixel in an image is a feature. 
And so again, it depends on the problem in the model. Um, so another example is like with an isolation forest, which is another really common uh, traditional like non-deep learning anomaly detection method. Uh, you would assign anomaly scores to each observation. And then in an uh, autoencoder, uh, you would you can you can through reconstruction error, you can have a reconstruction error uh, for each pixel, and then you can aggregate the error across all pixels for a given image, and then you have an anomaly score for that whole image. And we'll go into a lot more detail, in particular autoencoders, uh, later on. Here, like right now. So here we can um, potentially. Well, I, I just want to take a step back. Um, I'm going. I'm not going to assume that you know what an autoencoder is or MNIST. So I'll just explain that now. So MNIST is essentially um, handwritten digits from zero all the way to nine. And I think there's like 60,000 of them, and they're just simple like grayscale 28 by 28 pixel images. So very small. Um, and they're sort of like the hello world of machine learning in a lot of ways. And the task that is usually done on MNIST data is classification. Um, because there's 10 digits, you know, it's 10 class classification. And the idea is, okay, it's usually treated as a supervised learning problem as well. Uh, I have a model, I have labeled data from zero to nine. And so I'm gonna train this model and I want the model um, to correctly predict the digit or to correctly identify the digit that it saw. And so what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna, we're gonna do something different. We're going to pretend that like the digit nine, for example, is anomalous. And we're gonna treat all the digits zero to eight as inlier. And then we're gonna train a model uh, only on digits from zero to eight, which is inlier data only. And then at test time, we're gonna include the digit nine back in. And then we're gonna hope that our model can correctly predict that nine was an outlier. And so now we'll talk about what an autoencoder is. And so I'll like sort of assume that you, that like most people know vaguely like what a neural network is. Um, but essentially um, an autoencoder is like a specific type or architecture or family of architectures of neural networks. Um, so you could think of like each square here in this above diagram as, um, as a neuron or as a node to a neural network. Um, and you can think like loosely of like these dotted lines of like edges in the neural, neural network. And autoencoders have like this distinctive characteristic of having like this hourglass shape. And so the idea is the autoencoders have two parts. So there's the encoder half, which is the, the left, and then the decoder half, which is on the right side of the pink. And the idea, the job of the encoder is basically to take uh, high dimensional data uh, because there's just, because each blue node would, would exist for like one feature. Um, and then compress high dimensional data into low dimensional data, which would be uh, the red here or the pink here. Um, and so basically the encoder's job is to learn a concise representation of the data that uses fewer dimensions than you started with uh, while, while still keeping all the important information intact. Uh, and the decoder's job is basically to do the opposite. It's like given low dimensional data, can you kind of blow that up or expand it back into like high dimensional data? And so I guess the, the kind of classical use case of an autoencoder is you would usually like, I guess one example of using it is you would pass in uh, data that has noise and you want the autoencoder to remove that noise. And the idea is that if you train that autoencoder purely on images that had no noise, it should only have learned to create the image without noise which means that if you gave it something with noise, it should just kind of ignore that noise or remove it because it never learned how to make that pattern, which is the noise. Um, and the way you would do that, or I guess like the common way to train autoencoders is that let's say you have like a, like, like, like MNIST in this case, right? You have like a 28 by 28 uh, image. So that's how many input neurons you'd have here. And on the output, you'd have just as many neurons. And so you'd have your original MNIST image here, this eight, you'd shove it through the encoder takes a 28 by 28 image and it compresses it down to like you know, fewer, maybe not exactly three, but like something something very small number of pixels. Um, and then it's gonna, the decoder is gonna take that and it's gonna blow it up back into some 28 by 28 image. And so the idea is, is that on inlier data, which is the digits from zero to eight, uh, this autoencoder should do a great job of recreating the input image from with uh, at the output. Um, but the moment I show it like a nine, we expect that the reconstruction will look really bad um, because it's never seen nines during training. Um, and so we, so you could just take like the pixel wise error, which would be like the, the pixel wise difference between the original input image and the output image. Um, and the reason why you can do that is because like, well, I have 28 by 28 neurons in the input. I have 28 by 28 neurons in the output. I have 
I have things of equal like size. And so I can just do this pixel wise subtraction. And there's different kinds of um, yeah, like loss functions you can have for images. Like there's like uh, MAE or like MSE, uh, but I won't literally go into like the detail there because it depends on like what you're trying to do in the situation. So I'll, I'll leave that up to you. But essentially uh, just looking at this pixel wise error, that's what I meant by like, you can have an anomaly score per pixel going on. And you could see how like, okay, uh, I could just like go through all these pixels, right? And I could just add them up and then I'd have an anomaly score just for this one image. And so that's that's what I meant by you can have an anomaly score for per, per feature or per observation. Okay, and now we'll go over um, some model performance metrics for anomaly detection. So if what you're concerned about is model performance at a very specific, like one particular outlier score threshold, uh, then here's what you can think about. Uh, you can go at it from like, okay, well, do I have, you know, balanced classes or imbalanced classes? So if you have balanced classes, and by that, I mean, you have like an equal number of samples from each class. So like an MNIST you do, right? Because in MNIST you have like digits from zero to nine, and there's like roughly like 10,000 or something of each of them. Um, and so that would be balanced. And for that type of data, you can have a rock curve, which stands for like, I think receiving operating curve. Um, and if you have imbalanced class, which is the more common thing you'll see in anomaly detection, uh, where you have like, like to say like 90 or 95% inlier data and only 5% outlier data uh, in your training, then, uh, or and, and at test time, then you can use a precision recall curve. And so the reason why I, I, I said this, like if you have balanced data, use rock curve, imbalanced data, use a precision recall curve, is because precision recall curves don't include true negatives. Um, in either of their metrics. As precision is a metric, recall is a metric, neither of those two metrics have true negatives in them. Whereas in a, a rock curve, uh, they actually do. So the idea is that imbalanced data is inflated with a lot of true, like negative samples in general. So it's really easy for a model to like inflate its performance metrics just because it got lucky by guessing negative more often than not. And so that's like the first category of metrics you can think of. The, the second would be, um, what you care about is at all thresholds, at all outlier score thresholds. Uh, so the first one that's really common you'll hear is AUC, stands for area under the curve. Usually the curve they're talking about is the rock curve. Um, that's not always true though. I've read papers before where they, when they say AUC, they mean like the area under the precision recall curve. Um, so it really depends. Like just be careful about like how the, the, how the author has defined it. And AP stands for average precision. And that's usually like the area under the precision recall curve. Um, and again, like I've, I, I've seen AP before not mean something different where it's sort of like a weighted average of the precision, um, like depending on where the, where, like, yeah. So again, just like, just be careful, I guess, like just double check what the author is really trying to say. Um, yeah, so now we'll go into more detail about like precision and recall. And so I brought back our uh, confusion matrix here and like it's been now popular with an example. TV has like a basic dog cat classifier of the two classes. Here's the ways to fill it out. Now there's numbers populated instead of just symbols. It's, it's obvious that you want like, um, you want the numbers in the diagonal to be bigger than the numbers not in the diagonal because that's what you're gonna get right. But anywho, uh, let's go back to precision. So uh, precision and recall. Uh, so with precision, we define it like mathematically as the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus the number of false positives. Um, so I guess like, like the more easily digestible way uh, as a beginner to think about it would be like um, out of the observations that the model has uh, predicted positive or thinks is an outlier, how many of those predictions are actually correctly predicted as outliers? How many of those predictions are actually right? And so you can imagine like if I have a model that has 100% precision, you know, you can ask yourself right now, like, does that mean my model is like amazing, like perfect? Like, am I just done? Can I just like go home and I'm done for the day? Uh, unfortunately, no, because like if you have a model with 100% precision, um, then that just means that th that could mean that the model is just very, very conservative about predicting positive. So the model would rather predict, uh, like the model would rather like predict false negatives than, than predict like false positives. Um, so for example, let's say you had like 100 observations and only 10 of which are uh, outliers. Um, a model that predicts that, that that predicts positive on two samples, and those two samples happen to be actually like true outliers, then great, your your model has 100% precision. 
but you kind of know intuitively like that's not good enough because like, there's still like eight more outliers that weren't identified. And so this is where recall comes into play. And so with recall, to give you a more comprehensive image uh, of, of your model's performance is that recall is defined as true positives uh, divided by true positives plus false negatives. And so again, like the more, I guess like human digestible way uh, as a beginner to look at this is like um, out of the number of ground truth outliers that exist in my data, how many did my model like essentially predict correctly? How many outliers did my model actually get out of all the ground truth outliers that it could have gotten? And so you can imagine if you had a model that had 100% recall, that might not be like an amazing thing by itself, right? Because uh, going back to our example of like 100 observations and 10 outliers, um, if you have a model that let's say grabs like, like, li like it literally guesses outlier on all 100 observations, then it's going to have a recall of 100%, which isn't great, right? Because it just guessed positive on everything. Uh, and its recall will be really bad because it's going to have a lot of false positives. And so you can see here that precision and recall have like this balancing act where precision is sort of like the measure of how confident uh, your model is or how confident you can be in your model's predictions when it predicts positive. And recall is kind of a measure of a model's completeness of its ability to have found all the outliers in your in your data set. Um, and they, yeah, they, they're basically competing. And the important thing here is that if you look at the equations for precision and recall in the numerator and the denominator, neither of those things have true negative in them. And so that makes these two metrics particularly like more robust to class imbalance. Because usually like when you have an imbalanced data set, most of your data is going to be in liar, right? So most of that's negative. So it's kind of easy for a model to just have a lot of high uh, true negatives just because there are more negatives to begin with. And so that's why these, these two metrics were chosen uh, specifically for like that robustness. Uh, so yeah, here is a precision recall curve. Um, so yeah, on our x-axis we have recall and our y-axis we have precision. And you can see here that you have like this kind of like bending kind of this arch, this arc, I guess you call it. And it's uh, for the most part, like usually monotonically like decreasing. So it's usually when you go from left to right. Um, and it's exactly for like following the same intuition that I said earlier. Like if you have a model that has 100% precision, it could be because the model is just essentially like very timid. It, it would rather just like not be, not, rather not have any false positives and just take false negatives um, and vice versa for high recall. And so, uh, the orange line here, like that, that, sorry, that is that is the the precision recall curve. In particular, uh, for a logistic regression classifier, um, it's okay if you don't know what a logistic regression classifier. It doesn't really matter, uh, except that it just does binary classification. It's just predicting like yes or no or inlier outlier, but it doesn't it doesn't matter for this example. And the other thing to note is that like you have this dotted blue line, which is called like the no skill line, and that's essentially the level of like contamination you have in your data. So that would be like the percentage of observations that are outliers. And so the intuition here is that if your model was truly like not learning anything in its task and it was just guessing, then the orange curve should be very close to or on top of the, the blue dotted curve. Because, you know, like you have a model that's just guessing more, like more or less every time it sees something, on average, that model is just going to like have uh, is going to have precision roughly equal to the amount of contamination in the class, right? Like, however, yeah. So I think that's like fairly obvious, right? Like you've ten, you have ten outliers, you have like a uh, hundred samples, so it's like ten percent contamination. So if a model is just purely guessing, yeah, like ten percent of the time, like I can believe what it's saying because it's just guessing. So usually you want, so you, so you really want this orange curve to be like as um, as above like this blue curve as you can, and. The other point to mention, which would be, be more obvious in like another slide, but if you go back, if you can think back to like our histogram example with anomaly scores, um, for each for for each position of the threshold that we choose, that generates one point in this orange curve. So, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll talk about that again when we when we come to a future slide. Um, so like right here. So essentially, uh, so like I'll I'll do my I'll do my unifying example first. Sorry. So just like thinking everything that we've learned so far. So we'll do an, like a, a contrived example. And so let's say our task is we're trying to identify like non-MNIST digits for MNIST digits. So let's say 
this is like the full complete set of MNIST digits, like zero to, to nine. And non-MNIST digits could be like, I don't know, like a like an X or like a question mark or like an exclamation mark or like maybe like a grayscale picture of a dog. Um, and the data we're gonna have is gonna be image data, it's grayscale, it's 28 by 28, and half of that is outliers. So that's quite a lot of contamination. Um, the model we're gonna pick because we talked about autoencoders auto earlier is gonna be a simple autoencoder and it's only trained on inlier images. So just, just the regular MNIST from zero to nine. And our anomaly score is the reconstruction error um, per image. And just like before, and our performance metrics will be precision recall. Um, to be honest, uh, like the performance metrics here should probably be like the rock curve because like we actually have like good class balance like with 52% contamination. Uh, but just because we spent so much time talking precision recall, um, like I figured like we, I, I should, I'll just stick with that for simplicity. Um, so yeah, so you can visually kind of see this starting from the bottom left. Uh, if you have the original image eight, um, you can flatten that into like a really long vector, uh, push that into the autoencoder. The autoencoder kind of like spits out um, an output and tries to reconstruct the real image. You can then take like pixel wise difference between the input image and the output image. And that'll give you pixel wise like anomaly score. Um, you can then aggregate all those anomaly scores and to generate like one big anomaly score for the whole image. And then you can do that for all your images. Um, and then it'll give you the histogram on the bottom right uh, where anomaly scores vary it. You can see inlier and outlier distribution that have some overlap. Uh, and this is what I want to talk about in the previous slide, which was that you can see here that like for one position of this threshold that's chosen that generates one point in the above curve of the precision recall curve. And so if you were to take this threshold and start on the far left at zero and then slide it from left to right, you would generate a lot of points, like one point for each position of the threshold chosen. And that would generate a lot of points above as well with a logistic regression or, or in that precision recall curve of the like logistic regression classifier, or in this case, um, the anomaly, the, the simple autoencoder classifier. Uh, I guess that's a that's a typo. Sorry, up there, I should not say logistic there. Um, so, like for example, if you if you chose ten different thresholds on your anomaly score like histogram plot, then you should have ten different points in your precision recall plot above. Uh, yeah. So just to recap, um, an outlier definition like depends on context and time because sometimes outliers can change over time, uh, or what the definition of that can change over time. And in real life, uh, data is usually not labeled, which means that unsupervised anomaly detection has a lot of high business value. Um, and finally, like choosing performance metrics uh, depends a lot on the model application uh, context uh, because the cost of false positives and false negatives uh, are usually not equal. And yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, if you want to chat with me about anything, you can feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or on Discord. Um, it doesn't have to be about anomaly detection, really, like anything. Uh, school, career, resume, cyber products, or just hanging out. I, I'm happy to talk. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm going to end the recording now, and then I'll take questions in the chat.